Welcome, everyone. My name is Paul Quigley. I'm director of the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies, which is sponsoring this event, this research on uh, or this workshop, I should say, on researching African Americans during the Civil War era. I'm really glad to have you here with us. Uh, the center is based in the history department at Virginia Tech, and we've got a really simple mission. We want to promote education about all aspects of Civil War history among as wide an audience as we possibly can. So college students, students, school kids, teachers, professional historians, members of the general public, anyone interested in learning more about the Civil War era. So we do that in a wide variety of ways. We hold lectures and workshops like this one online at the moment, of course, but uh, typically in person. Um, we've also created a museum exhibit on Black Virginians during the Age of Emancipation. Uh, we've made a driving tour of Civil War era sites in Southwest Virginia, lots of other stuff besides. And everything we do is only possible due to the generosity of our donors. So I really want to thank our donors uh, for everything they do to support the center. And if you're interested in keeping up with what's going on at the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies, I encourage you to check out our website, civilwar.vt.edu, or you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter. It should be easy to find us there. We have a couple of other talks, online talks coming up that I want to let you know about. One of them is October 27th. It's by Jonathan Jones, and it's a talk on, on what uh, Dr. Jones calls America's original opioid crisis, civil war veterans and opiate addiction. Then on November 30th, we'll hear from Adam Dumby, who's the author of a recent book about the lost cause. And these are both gonna be webinars, just like tonight, uh, only one speaker instead of two. You can find the registration links on our website, again, civilwar.vt.edu. Just go to the events page. Everything should be easy to find there. The other thing you'll find at um, our website on the events page, by the way, is a link to a handout that accompanies tonight's event. Uh, I did send it to you all in an email about an hour ago in the reminder email. It's right at the bottom of the email, a link to a PDF document. I'm also going to paste it right now into the chat. Uh, feature the chat section of Zoom. So you should be able to click on that and get to it that way. And it's a guide that Dr. Newhall, one of our speakers, has prepared to list resources and tips, exactly the kinds of things you'll be hearing about in tonight's workshop. So that should be a useful resource, both now uh, as, as you're listening to the presentations, but also later you can go back and, and have a closer look at some of those resources if you want. Okay, uh, on to today's event. We've got two terrific speakers, uh, lots of time for discussion as well. And you'll all be able to ask questions using the Q&A section of Zoom. Uh, so hopefully that should be easy to navigate for you. Uh, you can post questions at any time. So you know you post a question now if you like during the talk, uh, at the end of the talk during the Q&A session. And you will not be able to see the questions you post. Only myself and the two panelists will be able to see the questions. But what I'm going to do during the Q&A session is uh, try and keep an eye on the uh, questions that are coming in. Try and make sure we get to as many as we possibly can, even though, of course, if you ask a lot of questions, we may not quite be able to get to them all by about 8.15, which is when we're aiming to wrap up. Well, our first speaker tonight is Dr. Kara Mosley-Hubbs. She works in education administration and research and program development. She's also an accomplished historian, writer, and as you're about to find out, speaker. She's the author of a wonderful book of creative nonfiction that I recommend to you all. It's called More Than a Fraction, and it tells the story of her enslaved ancestors, the Fraction family, who are actually enslaved uh, probably just about a mile away from where I'm sat right now on the campus of Virginia Tech. So it's a story that's very close to home uh, to those of us associated with the university and indeed Blacksburg in general. Our second speaker, tonight is going to be Dr. Caroline Wood Newhall, who graduated with her PhD from UNC Chapel Hill earlier this year. She recently joined us here at Virginia Tech. 
as postdoctoral fellow with the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies. And Dr. Newhall specializes in 19th century US history. She's currently working on a book about black prisoners of war in the Confederate South. And I know quite a few of you who are at tonight's webinar had the chance a few weeks ago to hear her talk about that project in our last webinar. And if you didn't, the event is recorded and is now available on the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies YouTube channel. Okay, that's all from me. Thanks again for being here. And I will pass things over to Dr. Kara Mosley-Hubbs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Quigley. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm just going to warn you, I went to the market today and every time I leave the house, I have this phantom cough because I think I contracted Corona each and every single time. So uh, <laughs> I will work on mentally getting past that so we can go, go forward and uh, get through things today. I do have a PowerPoint that I'm going to use to go through with everyone. And I'm going to go through it. It's going to feel kind of quick because I want to give um, Dr. Wood Newhall her time and then give you guys plenty of time for questions um, and hoping that you have some. Can everyone see my screen? Thumbs up. We're good? Okay. <clears throat> So what I'm going to talk about today is just doing some historical research about um, United States colored troops. And so what I'm going to look at is um, social records and military records and how you use those two things going forward. So for social records, I'm going to be talking about government records and newspapers. And then I'm going to separate into military records because that's kind of where the brunt of the information is um, when you're finding what you're trying to find. Um, I want to remind you, as Dr. Quigley put out, to please hold your questions until the end, but I think you're more than welcome to add it to the Q&A section of Zoom as you think of them. That way we can keep track of them, but we will try to answer them at the end up until about uh, 8.15. So one of the key things when you are working with people of African heritage in the United States because of the period of slavery is that you really need to work backwards. So you need to take the most frequent person that you have within the line that you're trying to follow. Um, and with timing in terms of when records become public, you're probably looking at someone, let's say about my generation's great grandparent and backwards. Um, because the timing is going to depend on what kind of records you're looking at. So when you're talking about the 1860s and before, you're really looking at things that could make you uncomfortable, like property records um, when it comes to enslaved individuals. Um, if you're looking at someone who is a freedman, even if they were of African descent, there may be some personal records there. But for the majority of us, we're looking at property records of, of people of European descent. When you get to the 1870s and after, you're looking at personal records. Seems seems things like the Census Bureau, because that's when they begin to appear as individuals, as persons in the United States. So when you're working backwards, you're going to take a modern time that you're going to go back and then you're going to bump into around the 1870 census and you'll still find people. Then when you get to the 1860s, you got to do some maneuvering. I'm going to give you some tips to do some maneuvering about where you go once you get before the point where they were appearing on census records as individuals. So the first thing, one of the first things you want to do is you want to think about surnames or last names. So um, if you are a member of the African American community, it's really no secret that a lot of our surnames come from, we're taught they come from the enslaver. We say it was the enslaver's last name. But there's actually some variations to surnames that are not actually commonly known. So the surname or the last name could be of the plantation of the enslaver. It could be a chosen family name. So at emancipation, many of them, the Freedmen Bureaus told them to choose a last name. So some of them may have chosen the last name of the enslaver, and sometimes they chose the last name of someone they admire. So a lot of times when you see Washington, it's because they admire George Washington and the legacy that he left. Um, or some other person who they admire, they may have take the surname of that individual. Um, there also might be a previously assigned surname where you're not too sure what the origin is and it may be a descriptor. So an example of that may be, for my ancestors, the last name Fraction. 
There's no evidence of an enslaver in the area with the last name fraction or a plantation in the fraction. But when you look at linguistics at the time, fraction was used in conjunction with fractious, which meant um, likely to quarrel or a little trouble. Son. And then when you kind of look at that history, it kind of makes sense that they possibly would have been given a surname as a descriptor of their personality traits um, and what kind of individuals they were. Um, and then you want to, some last names can come from the legacy of government documentation. So sometimes when you have African Americans or people of African descent with the last name Freeman, it's because at emancipation, when the Freedmen's Bureau was doing documentation, if you didn't choose the last name, they was describing you as literally a freedman. Um, and so that kind of carried over and you still are freedmen to this day. It's usually a story uh, or explanation I love to tell African American people when their last name is Freeman. I said, do you know where your last name may have come from? Um, and they love to hear that story because that's, that's a little bit more tangible than your last name comes from your former enslaver. So once you get a sense of the last name, um, I hate to say it, it's easier to follow males than it is females because up until the 21st century, females got married and we changed our last name. That's kind of changing a little bit. Um, not only are the girls like, I don't even know if I need to get married. When we do get married, you know, we're kind of keeping our last names now. Um, so for our descendants 100, 200 years from now, it'd be a little bit easier to find the women. But historically, women are hard to follow. So if this is your first go at doing some research, I recommend that you follow the men and their names. So one of the things that you want to look at is state records and state records include things like inventories and inventories are lists of property by people who were enslaving these African American people. And so I have an example of an inventory so you can see what it looked like and an inventory is literally a list of their assets, the things that they owned. And so those people would be listed with the furniture, with the cattle, um, with the silverware, all those things. And so when you look at an inventory list, you may be able to find those individuals by name listed as the enslaved population on the property. Um, a will is also a good place to look. So a lot of times when someone passed away, they would have to will their enslaved individuals to other folks. Sometimes they got really specific about who they were willing by name. And then sometimes it was just the enslaved population altogether. And the other thing that you want to look at is uh, slave schedules. Now, those don't usually provide names, but it provides some information so you can get a sense of birth dates and locations. Um, I'll give you some tips and some examples of how to do that um, based on how I did it for my own ancestry. So here's an example of an inventory. So if you see there is uh, John Fraction at 40, and so that's an ancestor of mine, and it's listed. And so where you see the larger numbers like 550, 400, 400, and 400, that was the value, the monetary value of those individuals. But their names are listed. And then sometimes, as you can see, a surname may have been listed. So you're able to follow that person and figure out where they were. You also have a will. So this is an example of a will. Um, wills and inventories of that period, we're not talking typewriters and of course we're not talking computers. So most, if not all of the documentation is handwritten this way. Uh, it might take a while to adjust your eyes to be able to read cursive. Um, and that's a fun activity to actually do with your children. If you have current children now who are not even doing cursive in school is <laughs> to kind of show them this documentation and try to practice with reading it. That's one of the things I've had done with my son. And he's like, it's no way I'm reading that. So your, your um, eyes will adjust after a while, but that's an example of a will. It'll be stated specifically. They'll talk about what city, what court system they're applying to a will to. You get some dates and some years, and then sometimes you get specific names. You also get names of uh, the enslavers or some of the other individuals that were there who would have to sign the will and testament. And this is an example of a schedule. So a schedule is really a number, a numerical count of the individuals that were there. But you can use that when you have an idea of um, age, because it lists age, it lists race, and it lists sex. And one of the reasons it lists race, because you're thinking a slave schedule is 
for slaves. So all of them should be black. But there was black and there was mulatto. Um, sometimes there's an appearance of I, which is Indian or N for native. Um, and then be careful about that because sometimes people of indigenous background were also marked as uh, B for black. It depends on how they look. If they look what they call um, Negroid features, they would list them as black, even if they were of indigenous background. Some other records to look at is federal records. And so with federal records, you have census records and you have records from the Freedmen's Bureau. And these two are very, very valuable with working backwards. Census records will get you from modern day till about the 1870s and you just follow people backwards. Um, I believe Dr. Wood Newhall, I'm not gonna get too much into uh, the different um, resources to find the census record because I believe that she's gonna go through it. Um, and if she doesn't, then during the q and I'll just kind of bring it up some more in the Freedmen's Bill records. I found the census records, which is like the census of today, just listed everyone in the household, very valuable for working forward. The Freedmen's Bureau records are very good about finding out about what they were doing in their lives when you want a little bit more detail. Um, so the Freedmen's records, it tells you if they had a bank account with the Freedmen's Bank, it'll tell you if they had cases, it'll tell you if they have interactions, it will tell you if they tried to vote, it will just tell you things about everyday lifestyle. And those are not things that we often research when it comes to this population. We just kind of want a list of facts, a list of locations, but we don't get too much in their lifestyle. Um, and so the Freedmen's Bureau was there to help individuals even after the Civil War and emancipation with their um, the beginning of the transition out of slavery. And so some Freedmen's Bureau workers, um, like Charles Schaefer out of the um, Montgomery County, Blacksburg, Christiansburg area was very, very detailed in his reports back to Washington, D.C. about all the things that were going on. Um, and so those are very helpful. So the census records, as you know, just lists the household and it gives you some information about um, you know, locations where people are. I wanted to zoom in on, this is a slave schedule. If you see, it says at the top page number 19, schedule two slave inhabitants in the county of Montgomery, of uh, the state of Virginia. And this is September, 1860. So if you see there where the check mark is, it says Robert T. Preston. And he was one of the Prestons that was at Smithfield, which is today the campus of Virginia Tech. And next to him is a count of his enslaved individuals. So you have one uh, an individual who was thought to be 100 years old, female and black, 71 years old, male and black, 56 years old, male and black, all the way down. And then all the way down on line number 19, we have one 20 year old male that's black. When we was working backwards, it makes sense that this is one of my ancestors, Thomas Fraction, because when we go mathematically, this is about the age he is at this time period, at the time of the schedule. So we're able to pinpoint that because here he is in 1870. If you see at the top, it says Schedule 1, inhabitants in the town of Salem in the county of Roanoke of Virginia on September 1870. He's at that top line. His name is Thomas Fraction. So in 1870, he's 30 in male and black. And then remember on the schedule, let's go back. If this is 1860, he would be 20 male and black. So that's likely him on that schedule. It also lists his household. So you have his wife, she's 24, female and black, and her job is keeping house. And then you have his daughter, Virginia, she's four, female and black, and her job is at home. Um, when you look at the census schedule, kind of look at all the details. So here he has a real estate value of $700, and it says his place of birth is Virginia. And then over here usually gives information about whether or not they can read or write. So we have 1870 here. Thomas Fraction is 30 there. And then the Freedmen's Bureau of Records. So the Freedmen's Bureau of Records, like I said, give you some more detailed information. That's one good place to find out if they had any um, military experience or 
Uh, the thing about people that were enslaved at the time, that their association with the military was not just as soldiers, they were also contraband. So often they would leave the plantation where they came and they would go to the Union soldiers. Many of the men would join the Union um, to fight as soldiers. Some of them would do some planting and some work and some laborious work to help out, but the women and children was there too. And so um, they often reported to the Freedmen's Bureau that they had that experience. And that'll help out with finding out your ancestors that helped um, this in the Civil War that weren't necessarily soldiers because sometimes those situations are there also. So this is an example of a Freedmen Bureau record. And so remember, everything is handwritten and God bless Charles Schaefer. He tried to fit so much into small pieces of paper um, and he tried to say a whole lot. So um, if you have it up here, you see the Bureau of Refugees and Freedmen and he's given his report from Virginia, where he is and the date. And then this is an example of one of the letter reports that he sent it out. So he's being very detailed. It says, Captain, I have the honor to report that the case of Thomas and Othello Fraction colored was continued until the first Monday in May on account of the absence of the Commonwealth Attorney and the Council of the Prisoners. It was postponed at the uh, March term of the county court at the request of said counsel, several very important cases require his attention at the Floyd Circuit Court convened during the pre present week. And so he gives a lot of detail. That's an example of what kind of things you're looking at. Um, Charles Schaefer and some of the others will also give you um, some information about their service, um, especially if they're dealing with somebody who's still tied up in um, their service records and you can get some more detail. So there you see Thomas and Othello Fraction, there's the mention of their names. And then here's his enlistment paper. So when you really want to get into, now that you have names, now that you have ideas of birth dates, now that you have locations, now that you have some experiences, you can try to get into the military records. A lot of the um, basic military records like enlistment, information is listed online. Um, you can go to fold3, that's fold, like fold clothes and the number 3.com, or you can just use Ancestry. They kind of link up together, but fold3 is probably um, the best thing to go to. And it'll give you this basic information so that you can get uh, information about um, where they served and when they served. And when you get that information, you're able to get um, full pension records from the National Archives. And that'll really give you information about uh, where they might have been stationed, the work they was doing, whether or not they ever visit the military hospital, the infamy. Um, and some of the records for our ancestry, we know that they went to the hospital for diarrhea. Like it's really, really detailed as far as the information that you can get from those records. And so here's an example. We have Thomas Fraction. He's a private in Company H of the 40th Regiment in the U.S. Colored Infantry. And so it's very important that you focus on the U.S. Colored Infantry because that's where um, African American and formerly enslaved individuals would have served in the U.S. Colored Infantry. If you find an ancestor who's not listed in the U.S. Colored Infantry, it's very possible that they were passing. And so um, you might just be looking at a um, very, very light-skinned African-American who was just uh, passing. And so even though he was a person of color and may have identified um, himself that way with the census records, at the time of the Civil War, they just kind of assigned him to that. And so this is also an example of the detail you can get. So we have here in February 1866, he's absent on furlough for about 30 days. Um, February 25th, 1865 is when he left. And that's a whole story within itself that we can't get in today about what happened while he was on furlough. It didn't go well. It was interesting. Um, so here's the volunteer enlistment papers for Othello Fraction, so you can see what it looks like when you come across one. It basically um, gives the information about they are agreeing to serve. It tells you how old he is. You can use that um, to narrow down on birth dates. He's 19 years old, um, enrolling in the Union Army for the Civil War out of Montgomery County, Virginia in April, 1865. 
um, after he ran away from the plantation that he was on. So just imagine your 19 year old today even thinking about um, doing something like that. So the National Archives and Records Administration, um, that is the link to order military records. So once you go into fold three and you have the information about um, their, their status, whether they're a private or sergeant, those are the most common. The most common are private. Every once in a while you come across a sergeant. It's not often that you see higher than that. If you see higher than that, or even a sergeant, I really recommend that you try to dig to find out what in the world they did to get that elevation um, within the Union Army. You can get the full military record once you go through the National Archives, and that'll give you detail of everything, um, where they served, um, when they served, and the different experiences that they have there. Military records can also give you information about pensions. So after they served and they left, their records will be in there about whether or not they requested a pension or whether or not when they passed away, their spouse or their children requested a pension and what that whole process looks like. That gives you an opportunity to find out um, what their lifestyles were like after the Civil War, um, what their experiences were, what their deaths were like and what happened to their uh, families afterwards. It was through the full military and pension records of Thomas Fraction that we found out how we got to Baltimore. Um, because we had thought that we had always been here in Baltimore and going through his record, we found out that we ended up in Baltimore um, uh, after Thomas Fraction passed away in Salem, Virginia. Um, so his, you know, wife is recording kind of um, terrorization and experience she's having from the local government about taking everything that Thomas Fraction um, had gained for himself. And instead of fighting it, she says, forget it, I'm going to leave. And she came to Baltimore and a lot of us are still here today. And so this is a screenshot of the National Archives. So once you go on the main website, it'll be pretty obvious. There will be an option there to order reproductions like you see here. Um, and then when you order reproductions, they give a really good link about determining what you should order. Um, you can order census records and everything, but I would just recommend to order the full military record, including pensions, and just get everything. It takes them a little while to see if they find it, and you have two options when you do that. You can ask them to send you a printed copy, which they can do, and you can ask them, ask them to send you a digital copy, which will come as an email attachment. Um, some military records that I have received have been very thin and very um, small and kind of brief, like there wasn't a lot of details. And then there are others that I have received that were like books. Um, and so, you know, you don't know what you're going to get, but whatever you get, you enjoy flipping through the pages. And I do want to take, tell you when you're flipping through the pages to please take your time and do it three times. The first time you're just going to be excited that you got it and you're gonna think that you read it all. The second time you're gonna have come across one piece of information and you're gonna keep flipping the pages, but you're really gonna be thinking about the thing that you just read. And then the third time as well, you can really, really get into it and pay attention to all the details. And I want you to really look at with the eye of your family and your experience and your culture so that you can catch some things within those documentations that normally wouldn't be caught. Um, you may see something like somebody's favorite thing is listening to music and then you know you love music yourself and it give you really give you a chance to really connect to your ancestry um, and and really develop them as individuals and as persons as you move forward to do more research about them so then you bring it all together another thing that you want to look at is newspapers so newspapers.com is also like a sister to ancestry.com. So newspapers.com, just have some fun and punch in the name of your aunt sister to see what kind of experiences they were having. Um, so for the fractions, just pumping it, pun punching in the name of all the aunt sisters is when we found out that um, one of them had got arrested for having a gun and it was like, wait, what? <laughs> so you kind of get that more information and you also find about uh, whether or not they had other military experiences because newspapers at that time was like Facebook and Twitter. Everybody's information was in the newspaper. Everybody's business is in the newspaper. And so that's a really good way to get more information. So when you want to bring it all together, like we did in more than a fraction, you have historical records and you have transcripts and some of that is online. 
once you get online, online really will give you the basis of information, but you also want to try to go in person and physically visit historical centers and libraries and courts. Not everything is scanned and available online. Um, and I would, I would be so inclined to say, I think a lot of things are not actually scanned and available online. I think that's a goal historically for a lot of libraries to put a lot of things online, but there's so much out there that's really going to take generations, you guys, and we are first generations of scanning things online. So it's not going to happen anytime soon. So you take some of them personal vacation days and you go to the courts and the libraries and you flip through this documentation. Ask me how I know. Uh, so historical records, you look at um, records, you look at signatures, and you look at statements. So this here is an example in this picture of a statement within the full military record of Thomas Fraction. And so um, he's applying for a pension and, you know, they're asking him like how he got his injury or while he was in jail. And he's like, because somebody shot me in the leg. Uh, within the pension when they're interview him and they say, well, he says somebody shot him in the leg and the doctor says in the pension records, but I don't see the bullet. And then there's transcription of Thomas Fraction responding because the bullet is in my leg. And so you kind of get a sense of his sarcasm um, within that. So what we learned from all the research we put together is the time period is um, 1860 Virginia Civil War. They came from a plantation. We have the enslaved individuals who started out without a, a detail or a picture. We have the state senator, which was William Ballard Preston. And then we have Robert Taylor Preston was kind of the black sheep of the family. So we start building this story just based on the records. Um, because the state senator, William Ballard Preston, is, is one of the people who actually drafted the papers of succession for Virginia. And then the black sheep of the family, Robert Taylor Preston, actually served for the Confederate Army. And so we was getting this full picture. Uh, we know the social climate at the time, we take that into consideration. The Civil War is going on. And one of the things that Robert Taylor Preston wanted to do was help increase production to support the Confederate armies. And so, you know, he was trying to, you know, a lot of times the enslaved individuals, the enslavers at that time would try to use enslaved individuals to help the Confederate army with their labor. Uh, we have the environments, we have the Confederate Rail and Robert T. Preston and all of their experiences of going through that system in Virginia. Virginia, when you start digging, is really into the subject of slavery. At first, they were for the emancipation of the enslaved, but they wanted to do it in a way that can ensure the safety of its white, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? constituents. And so one of the things was shipping everybody over to Liberia, but that's another story. Um, we have the major historical events at the time. We look at the Union infantry and how they were taken over Virginia. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of the enslaved individuals knew that they could run as contraband to the Union Army because they were really taken over the area at the time. And the Union Army was welcoming the enslaved soldiers um, early on because they were able to use their labor um, and use their willingness to fight on their side to their advantage. And so we take a seemingly unknown individual and we give them a face. So this is not any of the fractions, but I just wanted to give you a visual idea of you taking just the idea of an ancestor or of a slave individual and then creating a person and having a, a, um, a full personality and someone to refer to by the end of your research. And so you find out more. They were abused. They were confident. They were intelligent. They were desperate. They were dangerously outspoken. And then you'll want to do some more research and not just your own ancestors, but other individuals. And you'll start finding pictures of Jacob Johnson and all of these other individuals who there are records and pictures for. And then you start thinking about the weaknesses of the period, the social conditions, the fugitive slaves, and the birth of the KKK around the same time. And so you really can uh, get a sense of what they were fighting against. It wasn't just the plantation where they were, but it was the whole story, the whole experience and the whole history um, that they were dealing with. And so you get that, um, you know, the Civil War was something way bigger to them than it probably was for other people. 
And so you might find out about events. So what we found out about the fractions is that they ended up with a, a guns drawn standoff with their former enslaver while they were on furlough. Um, because as Thomas Fraction had stated in his own statement, when um, his former enslaver told him that he had, should have never returned to um, the plantation after he left, in Thomas Fraction's own words, and then I ended there as he said, uh, I'm a soldier now and I fought for my freedom um, and I'll defend myself if I need to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move straight on to our second speaker, Caroline Newhall. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate that, Dr. Mosley Hobbs. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, let me get this set up. There we go. You'd think I'd be better at this by now. Okay. <laughs> so uh, as Dr. Mosley Hobbs said, there are so many resources out there um, and really interesting ways of making connections between, you know, just slivers of information that you can compile and collate together uh, to put into something really incredible and really start to dig into the lives of people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so just to give you a little sense of my research and my experience with the archives, I first started uh, graduate school looking at the Amer African American soldiers in the USCT who were captured and enslaved basically in the Confederacy. And I, you know, looked through the various sources uh, that we've spoken about, you know, census records, military records, uh, so compiled military service records that are on fold three, and then put that in conversation with pension files, which I've also collected quite a few of those, and really started to try and read between the lines, um, you know, go beyond the, the ledgers, see what the voices are that are that are present in these records. And so there's a lot that I found because I have, you know, the institutional privilege and the time to compile this kind of research. You know, I had years essentially to dig through fold three and ultimately come up with 2300 names of individual men who were taken captive in the Confederacy and then trace their families through the pension files, through census records, uh, through a variety of sources and start to build that out and understand, you know, family networks, kinship networks, relationships uh, on various farms and plantations which is something that you don't get to see very often. But with digitization, thank goodness, this is becoming more and more possible. So this is going to kind of be a crash course on doing research in the age of COVID, right? It's, it's a little difficult to get into archives right now. Um, so I want to give you a sense of some of the things I've been able to do just online from the comfort of my home uh, and the ways I've been able to build on that. And then also to talk about ways that we can expand our horizons by being in conversation with one another. Um, I've really found that being in conversation with other historians, with archivists, with researchers, with National Park Service employees, you can find an abundance of information you might not have ever thought possible. So I want to give you all a sense of some of the things that are out there. You know, there's a ton of resources that I've tried to put together, at least some of uh, in the handout sent to you today. So I, I encourage you to look through that. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, where to start? I, I basically <laughs> realized, you know, there are things that I look through and then want to revisit and I can't remember what I did with them. So I can't emphasize enough how important an organizational system is. So that's something I just want to put out there as a general piece of advice is figuring out the system for yourself of how to keep track of the sources you find, how to get back to them, you know, take note of important keywords um, for yourself so you can look through it on your computer and find it quickly. That was something I was really kicking myself about throughout my research for my dissertation where I take a note of something I didn't put a good note together and and I couldn't find it for weeks afterwards. Uh, so I like to use spreadsheets as basically kind of a database for myself, uh, compile primary sources that I look at, secondary sources, and then important people. So that's just something I really recommend moving forward is just a way to collate your research and then you can start to see patterns that you might not have ever realized were possible. So uh, some of the things that we've talked about, uh, definitely military records, right? The um, 
important uh, compendium of the War of the Rebellion is a great place to start. And I, I gave you this screenshot here to show you that it's free and available through Google Books. Uh, I would not have been able to do the research I have been able to without word searches. <laughs> I love digitized records uh, precisely because you can do a quick search for particular terms. So if you have an idea of what particular regiments you want to look for, these kinds of resources are generally readily available um, and accessible and you can look through these records to find the movements of particular uh, regiments, for example, see where they went throughout the war. Um, and from that, you can get kind of a general sense of context. And I have to say, you know, building a sense of context of what's going on with the people you're looking into is really helpful for finding different ways to expand upon your knowledge of them. And one thing I want to make sure uh, that you all know too is that regiment names changed quite a bit for the USCT. That's something to keep in mind. I had a lot of trouble with that beginning early on, um, you know, Regiments like the 1st North Carolina uh, Colored Volunteers became the 35th United States Colored Troops. They, they got changed over time. Uh, so the National Parks uh, and Service Sa Soldiers and Sailors Database is a really great resource for that, along with the Compendium of the War of the Rebellion by Frederick Dyer. You can kind of trace where these regiments were, uh, how they changed over time, what the name changes were, and that can just give you a better sense of how to keep track of what's going on. Because sometimes, you know, the, the official records of the Civil War will talk about a particular battle in a particular regiment, but that regiment might not be the same name that you're looking for in Fold 3. So I definitely went through some growing pains trying to figure that out. Uh, so these are these are resources that are re readily available and I highly encourage, you know, just starting on the internet and typing in search terms, going to resources like newspapers.com, you will never know what you can find. It's pretty uh, amazing what's out there, but there are limitations and that's a, the, a consistent problem. But the official records um, are quite helpful for having a general understanding of what's going on with particular regiments. Uh, it's organized chronologically and by region. So if you happen to know what regiment uh, an ancestor was in or somebody you're researching was in, you can potentially trace that through something like the official records, which is also, I think, uh, generally available for free online. I, I you know, encourage free access as much as possible. So I tried to provide some sources for you that are both paid and free. So if you don't wanna spend um, you know, $70 trying to track something down, there, there are workarounds, I should hope. Um, but so this is an example of something that you can find in the official records. And, and again, this is something you can do a word search for um, and looking for particular regiments, looking for particular names, generally last names are helpful there. But this is a, a good way to start finding out people who are connected to the people you're trying to track down as well. Uh, having a sense of who the officers were who were leading particular regiments can be helpful. Um, and again, you know, understanding what personal papers to look through can be really, really helpful as well. Um, you know, the unfortunate fact is that for a lot of the men I've studied, most of the records that are out there have to deal with their enslavers and their enslavers, you know, for former enslavers, uh, personal records and, and pensions, or excuse me, personal papers and uh, genealogical uh, research. So something I was able to track uh, looking through the official records uh, for a couple of men from a Massachusetts regiment, was able to find that they're related to a pensioner from the American Revolution and so looking through his name uh, on ancestry and then taking that as far back as I could, found some records through the Massachusetts uh, Historical and Genealogical Society on uh, service that uh, their ancestor had, had gone through and details about him that were really very helpful. Um, so there are possibilities of finding things in records that you might not necessarily uh, have thought to look through before. So something to keep in mind. Um, and again, the digitized newspapers are so, so helpful. Um, one thing I really found was just looking for particular terms, um, particularly in Southern newspapers like Yankees, Uniform, uh, those were really helpful. Casting a wide net, you know, you might just start looking for particular places and, and actions and events. If you know a date that's of importance, you can start with that and start with that in the particular place. Um, there are examples like this throughout the Civil War of people who are named and then named along with their enslavers. Um, so prison records are, are rife with these kind of advertisements. The 
Civil War continued very much uh, in terms of continuity of practice with enslavement and dealing with people who were refugees, who were trying to escape from slavery, who were trying to resist slavery. Uh, so there's a lot out there that you can potentially find, um, particularly, you know, Richmond newspapers are all over the place on newspapers.com. And I found those quite helpful as well because they're constantly reporting on what's going on in the city. So again, you know, you can compile these, these various records together and start tracing people through various uh, iterations. Something to keep in mind as well. In Fold 3, I just wanted to give you a, a quick sense of how that works uh, as you go through it. It looks a little different these days since I took these screenshots, but there's a lot out there. Um, a lot of the records are digitized, particularly for the U.S. colored troops, and those are generally listed under their final regiment names that I mentioned before. You know, some of them change over time, so keep in mind the final designation of these regiments, which, as I mentioned, you can look at at through a Dyer's Compendium or through the National Park Service website. But you can find quite a bit of information about people, you know, their, their age, uh, where they're from, their site of birth, um, their occupations that they had, sometimes, you know, their euphemisms um, for, you know, laborer or farmer, things like that. But you can also find some surprises that you, you didn't anticipate. Um, so my research is on prisoners of war. And these kinds of details that I found in the military service records were really helpful to give me a sense of some of these men's stories. Um, this particular man, James Ottaway, Private James Ottaway was uh, captured along with a lot of men from his regiment and placed to work uh, by a Confederate captain during the war. And so that gives me some hints of where to look moving forward into this man's history in West Tennessee, um, trying to figure out this rebel captain Scoff. I, I'm pretty sure I found him. His name's not Scoff. I think it's Skiffield, something like that. But uh, the ways in which you can start undertaking some detective work by just finding the various names of people within these records and they can contain a multitude um, of different things there's there's correspondence sometimes um, as well as other records so the fold three access is really really helpful as is ancestry.com but again those are paid resources so things you can consider uh, as alternatives are family search for example and using your local library um, institutional access is really helpful for trying to access records through these genealogical websites so if you can reach out to a local university to see if they have access and try and get guest access you can apply for uh, free trials for at least a week for a few of these things. So you can use that to dip your toes in and see what you're able to find. And this was really how I got started. It was just kind of delving into military records um, and seeing what I could find, you know, finding names and then going from there and building it out. Um, so, you know, collating that with newspapers, using newspapers to look for names and places. Also maps and directories are quite helpful particularly after the end of the Civil War. Um, you know, after 1870, the, the census provides a lot more information. And you can find a lot about people's professions, uh, if you can find them in directories. Google searches are helpful for that as well. There are a lot of maps available uh, on the uh, Library of Congress website. Sanborn fire maps I have found are quite helpful for having a sense of place and space. Um, I think that all is really important to consider when trying to put together uh, the stories of, of people during the Civil War. Things also like findagrave.com uh, are actually quite helpful and have a lot of records of cemeteries uh, throughout the United States. So you can take a chance, try and enter some names, see where people are buried. Um, and that can sometimes give you some additional genealogical information that you might not have known from the, the typical records that you're looking at. So cast a wide net, do whatever you can to, to find people, but there's a lot out there. Um, and I highly recommend, you know, looking into these digital sources and seeing what you can find and where you kind of run into walls. And that's when you can really reach out to uh, archivists and to librarians and enlist their help. Historians as well. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that, you know, historians do a ton of research in archives, you know, things that are not uh, made available to the public or digitized. 
So you can use something like Google Scholar to, to find citations. If there's a particular record group that you're looking for, but you're having trouble accessing yourself, see who's citing it. Uh, if you use Google Scholar and you type in these records, you can find people who are using them in their books. And I highly recommend that and checking out what they might have available and contacting them. We're, we're personable people and we love to share our knowledge and our research. So uh, I definitely recommend historians as an added resource as well. Uh, pension files are one of the um, most detailed sources I've been able to work with in terms of affidavits. People often talked about their experiences during the war. Um, if they were able to acquire a pension or at least even apply for a pension but most of them are not digitized. That can be difficult to find. So accessing them through the National Archives and, and purchasing a copy is absolutely a great way to go. Uh, the widow's pensions are generally, I believe, all digitized on Fold 3. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, if you're able to find a spouse's name and track them down through Fold 3, you can find uh, a lot of information through wives and through these women. Um, so that's a really important way of getting at some finer details that you might not normally have access to. But yeah, the, the pension files have affidavits from neighbors, from family members, from church members. You can get a sense of what a community looked like. Um, so there are a lot of different avenues that these kinds of records can open up for you. If you're getting stuck on certain details about a particular individual, you know, somebody in their, in their uh, orbit, essentially, might have more information that could help you. Um, and you know, understanding friendships and understanding relationships within a community is really, really helpful for starting to understand people's personalities and putting all of this together. So I can't, under, I can't overstate enough uh, how helpful a pension file can be for getting to understand a person on a personal level. So if you happen to be able to find anything um, on a particular person, definitely pursue that if you can. Um, and there are a lot of historians like myself who are working with pension records. So if you're confused about pulling them in person or what the process is, you can definitely reach out to somebody like me. Uh, you can reach out to the archivists at the National Archives who will happily walk you through the whole process before you get there. It can be really difficult sometimes to pull information if you don't quite know what you're looking for. It's a lot of detail. So, you know, make use of, make use of people essentially is the best advice I can give. Uh, I really relied on the help of a lot of archivists and people in the National Park Service to point me in the right direction when I was struggling, you know, with particular walls of research. Also digital humanities projects. Um, this is something I ultimately hope to do as well with my research is putting up a database online that's easily accessible, um, that that is free and open access. Uh, I think, you know, open access is the way to go for these kinds of projects. You know, making this information widely available um, and, and open to as many people as possible is huge. There's a lot out there. Um, and I gave some details of that on the, on the handout, but the Colored Conventions Project, the Freedom on the Move Project, these databases provide a lot of information um, that you might not have even expected. So you, you know, take a look and see what's available. Um, touch base with the people who are involved there. I'm sure more than willing to help, but um, they're also a plethora of genealogical societies. I'm sure many of you are involved with quite a few of those as well. There are a ton in Virginia, um, people who are dedicated to this kind of research day to day. Um, so there's really a lot out there and more and more is becoming available every day digitally. Um, so if you can start from home and try to access things you know, for free uh, as you're able, I highly recommend that. Uh, it can be difficult to, to put these things together. And then you know, sources like the National Park Service, uh, I, can't, I can't overstate as well <laughs> their helpfulness. And, and the sources that they've been able to collate and provide, um, you can find photographs and start putting faces to names, um, as well as resources like the Civil War Photo Sleuth, for example, that the Civil War Center uh, has available. So this multitude of resources is available to us online. Oops, sorry, I <laughs> accidentally went through that. Uh, but basically, also reading between the lines, uh, like Dr. Mosley Hobbs said, there's a lot that you can parse out from what is provided in bits and snippets that you might not have ever realized. And so, yeah, reading through sources several times over, keeping track of what you're finding, put it together, have conversations with as many people as possible about what you're looking for, because you never know what you'll be able to find. 
Uh, so basically, I think there's a lot that you can do to expand the horizons of research and, you know, compare maps, compare personal records, compare genealogies. Uh, the USCT has several regimental histories that are out there that I highly recommend looking at. Um, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head how many have regimental histories, but there are quite a few available out there. Uh, and they tend to make some mention of what's going on with individual men, uh, officers, and so you can put together a whole host of information to help build out uh, your understanding of what's going on with particular individuals. So uh, things to keep in mind, the naval resources are also available. I know somebody asked about that in the, in the Q&A. Uh, the naval pensions uh, can be accessed on Fold 3, some of them at least, particularly through widows applications. So that's something to keep in mind as well, that there are naval pensions, naval service records. They look a little different from the typical military records, but there is uh, information that's out there. So if you just start even doing regular Google searches, that's a good way to see what's even available on sites like Ancestry and Fold3. Usually some names will come up with dates if you're looking for particular people. Um, but yeah, work backwards, uh, cast a wide net, try as many resources as you can online, see what's out there for free, put it all together and, and see what you come up with. So. I'll end with that and we can uh, go into the Q&A from there, but uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you both so much for your presentations. Very interesting and uh, I really appreciate and I'm sure the audience appreciates as well how uh, helpful the, the information was and you know the practical advice you gave to people who may be you know thinking about or actively doing this kind of research for themselves. So uh, for the audience, uh, thanks for the questions you've already submitted. Um, feel free to type more questions as they occur to you into the Q&A box. And again, we'll get to as many as we possibly can in the time available. Uh, one of the questions I'd like to address um, is kind of a logistical question from Charles Hawley. Is the presentation recorded and available? And we certainly are recording the presentation and we'll make it available. Uh, it, it will take a week or two, but it will appear on the YouTube channel of the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies. Uh, so that should hopefully be easy enough to find. If not, uh, you can always go to our website, civilwar.vt.edu and look for the previous events page and you'll see links to recorded presentations there. So that was a ki kind of an easy one to get started with. Um, now I'm going to uh, choose some questions to, um, to steer towards the panelists. And one of the questions I'd like to start with is from Lois Levine. Uh, she asks, she's looking into the history of several African-American individuals and families. She knows they were living in Richmond prior to the Civil War, but doesn't yet know whether they were free or enslaved people. Um, so she's asking, you know, is there some kind of state registry? Is there some kind of resource either one of you would recommend just to start trying to find uh, these individuals and figure out were they enslaved, were they free? Well, uh, I am not totally sure about that specific question. I think a good place to start there is the Library of Virginia. Uh, there are a number of archivists and genealogists on hand who are really experienced with those kinds of records. Um, court records, for example, are, are rife in the state archives, and I know they have a lot of good information and access to that. So that could be a good place to start with asking somebody particular questions about where to look for those individuals. Yeah, uh, one other thing to consider is a process of elimination. So if you have the names, just do a simple check for um, census records. If they were freemen, there is like a census, a list of freemen of the counties in the area. So if they are free, they're going to be listed separately, of course, because everything is segregated. But there is a schedule, a separate list of freemen in a county. Um, if they are not listed there, then it's a kind of a process of elimination that you can, it's probably safe to assume that they were enslaved individuals. If they are enslaved individuals, then your best bet is to look for some other records. Um, there's probably a record somewhere where they had been asked who their former master was. Um, and don't let that terminology make your eye twitch like it does mine. 
But um, when, if they're ever asked that question and it's recorded, then you can, you know, specifically find out who their former enslaver was, and then you can start researching that person. Remember, the key to the enslaved community is not researching the person, it's researching the place of which they were enslaved, and that's where all their records are. So it's a process of elimination. I recommend you first just um, search for the name in the census records. If they don't come up in the list of freemen, of the county, then they're probably enslaved individuals and you need to pinpoint who, were, who they were enslaved by last uh, within Richmond. Um, a big hint of that might be when you get to the period of 1860 or 1850 is look at their surname. Um, um, you know, if you have a surname for them, find out if there was a plantation or an enslaver in Richmond of that last name and see if they just picked up the last name of that enslaver, that's a good place to start. Great, thank you. Um, another question uh, asks about uh, the uh, history of South Central Pennsylvania, and specifically whether either of you have got any recommendations for places to look for records of individuals who were kidnapped from South Central Pennsylvania by Confederate forces during the Gettysburg campaign, and then taken to Virginia and enslaved, re-enslaved, wherever the case may be. Any thoughts or suggestions for resources on that specific topic? You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was going to say, actually, I would start with the Freeman's Bureau um, mm -hmm. of the newspapers, because remember, once you get to emancipation, especially individuals like this that were kidnapped, one of the first things they do is try to find their families. Um, and right after emancipation, there's a lot of newspaper ads where formerly enslaved folks are literally running ads looking for their family. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau, a lot of the, um, the officers for the Freedmen's Bureau were actually helping the formerly enslaved individuals try to find their families. So when you're trying to, to figure out what happened to people during that period, see if you can track their attempts to find their family or their family's attempts to find them. And that'll give you... Um, uh, a nice place to start with individuals such as that. Yeah, definitely agreed. I haven't come across that because I haven't really looked into it myself just yet. Uh, I've gotten that question several times, so I, I know I need to look into this topic. Uh, it's really important to understand in terms of what the Confederacy was trying to do and what it was trying to do even beyond its own borders. Uh, mm -hmm. I know Dr. Hillary Green has done some research onto this. Um, I can't remember exactly what she found, but she might be worth reaching out to with some questions. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't say I know for sure what's, uh, what happened with them yeah. uh, afterwards, but. Yeah, and think about yourself. If you were kidnapped and then you managed to get free, what's the first thing you would do? You would try to get home, Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so try to track it that way and, and mm -hmm. you know, get some more information with that. Um, a, a question I've been wondering about um, is, you know, you both touched on this sort of indirectly in your presentations, but the differences between researching white individuals during this time period and black individuals during this time period. Um, what are the key differences, you know, especially thinking about the sources that you're pointing people towards in the National Archives and so on? Is a lot of this stuff the same for white soldiers as for black soldiers? What are the key differences there? So for white soldiers, um, you know, they're pretty much similar records in terms of compiled military service records. Um, I think a little more detail sometimes perhaps in the regimental histories that are out there. Uh, and they just have, you know, I think tend to have more records available by name prior to the Civil War and up to the Civil War. So that is something to contend with is just that kind of longer historical reach in terms of just being able to identify specific names. Um, so that can make things a little easier for researching white soldiers in particular. Um, but yeah, I, I think there is 
a lot of overlap in terms of the use of newspapers to really emphasize uh, important events and people and visitation. That's certainly happening for uh, Black Americans as well as white Americans, um, especially after the war. But that's, you know, The Liberator and uh, other newspapers like that have been great resources for me in trying to track down particular people. Um, but yeah, there, there is a lot out there. And I know, you know, there's just more available in terms of the personal records um, compared to, to the property records, unfortunately. Yeah, I would make that same assumption, but I have to be honest, I haven't read a military record of a white soldier <laughs> because I hate to say it, I haven't really had a need to at this point in my research. <laughs> same. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, I would assume that um, it's... Uh, like Dr. Um, Newhall was saying, is that the, the personal records before and after is probably um, a lot more robust. Um, and then I could probably imagine that the uh, military representatives who are dealing with these, these records were probably a little bit kinder to white soldiers. Um, I think for the fractions at least, it, it, it read to me that they were really put through the rigmarole about even attempting to claim a pension or claim to write to something. Or um, there's even what Thomas Fraction, he went from being a private to a sergeant. And then when he was shot and he was put in jail and he was having that whole experience with racism, they demoted him from sergeant to private as if that experience was his fault, you know? And so his whole experience was, you know, um, you know, I can't imagine what it's like to not only fight for a system or a country that you know does not return that favor to you. Um, so, you know, I would just imagine that it's a little bit kinder for white soldiers, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure because I've never read one. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think you're right there. Um, one comment, it, it's more of a comment than a question really. I think uh, going back to what we were discussing a moment ago about researching um, African Americans in Virginia in particular, one um, attendee is drawing our attention to the cohabitation records, mm -hmm. um, which were of course produced in the years following the Civil War to almost do a, an alternative census for African Americans who hadn't been recorded by name in censuses before um, and to tra keep track of, you know, who was uh, cohabitate, cohabiting and, um, and so on and so forth. Have either of you used those records and can you say something about their benefits? Yeah, I have. Um, those records will be, was really helpful with identifying married couples who weren't legally married yet um, to identify some of those relationships, who the mothers of certain children were, um, and, you know, who was together. And then those co cohabitation records, what kind, will also tell you, like, where the other spouse came from in terms of plantation. Um, some of those records get really detailed about who the former master was. So that's a good record in terms of, you know, hunting down um, before 1860. So. Yeah, I have not used the cohabitation records yet. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm getting into the process of dealing with the more uh, on the ground level research. Um, I really did a lot, mostly with the military records and the pension files, census records, basically things that I could find and identify and then go get in person. Um, but yeah, getting down to, to those brass tacks is something I'm, I'm looking forward to doing. So I have not used those myself, but I imagine they'd be quite helpful for this kind of research. Um, another kind of record that uh, James Blair is asking about are the Southern Claims Commission records. Um, and I think many of these are available via uh, Fold3, if I'm not mistaken, a uh, resource uh, you, you've mentioned. Um, so have either of you used the Southern Claims Commission records and how valuable were they? Um, I have searched it, but I didn't find um, anything relative to the individuals that I was tracking at the time. Similar, yeah, same problem. <laughs> Looking for a needle in a haystack and I wasn't exactly. able to find anything. Yeah, I guess that's often the case with this kind of research. Um, 
let's see, uh, other questions include uh, a very specific one, uh, which sounds like it's related to this individual's uh, personal research experiences. Uh, Andrea McDonald is asking whether either of you have encountered an abandoned approved widow's pension and could speak to why a widow with children who had not remarried would abandon her pension. So again, it sounds like there's a specific story behind this and uh, maybe it's unique, but either of you have any thoughts on that? Um, if we're talking about African-Americans, um, there is a possibility of wanting to drop off the radar. Um, uh, a lot of times the, the process for getting a pension is not smooth or kind or very nice. Um, and I, even though it's not documented to why they abandoned it, they just, they abandon it. Just if I think about uh, modern day descendants of, of you know, uh, enslaved Africans and African Americans, just sometimes you just want to disconnect from the system at all. Um, you don't want to owe them anything in your mind and you don't want to continuously have to document, have to prove, have to explain yourself. And so you get to a certain point and it's, it's, I'm better off trying to take care of myself and my children than continue to deal with them. And I just want to be off, off their radar. Yeah, along those lines, uh, I've read through quite a few widows' pensions and a pension application was a disruptive and invasive process. I mean, there's no way around that. You are being asked incredibly personal questions. Your community members are being asked questions about your personal life, about your behavior, whether you're moral or not, uh, particularly for wives of soldiers who are trying to uh, continue a pension after their husbands have passed away. So they are subjected to a lot of scrutiny, um, both by pension examiners who are pretty much always white. Um, and then, you know, they're going around the community, talking to, to neighbors, to family members, um, and secrets came out. That, that is something that is also something to reckon with when it comes to pensions is, you know, sometimes information came out that I don't think people really wanted revealed. Um, yeah. And, and sometimes can... even traumatic experiences, uh, like for the fractions, mm -hmm. they spoke to some of the um, community members and family and friends to Isabella Fraction, who was married to Thomas. And um, they claimed that she was married before Thomas and never got a divorce. So the marriage wasn't legitimate and came to find out that, you know, in the onset of um, the Civil War, she was forced into some placebo marriage on the plantation to the um, Negro son of another enslaver. So she wasn't even sure if she had really gotten married. She said, they told me to meet at this cabin. I was going to get married. He married me. They sent us off to, uh, I think it was like Richmond. He said he was going to leave to go to work and he never came back. So, you know, so that's just this whole traumatic experience for her as a slave individual to be forced into this marriage with this man that she didn't know who disappeared afterwards. And they're hammering her about the fact that basically you were married before and the man that you spent 20 30 years with isn't really your husband and so after a while you know even she was just like i don't think she's listed as abandonment but like i said after a while she was just like forget it and she came to baltimore so mm -hmm. yeah there was a big problem after the end of the war too with uh former slave states upholding uh, cohabitation and marriage laws when it came to enslaved couples in particular. So sometimes, um, you know, if you didn't get married in a court of law or you have that piece of paper after the war, it wasn't considered legitimate. If you didn't have the permission of a former enslaver, it wasn't considered illegitimate. So even if you were still living as husband and wife after the war, you didn't have that antebellum approval that could count against you, which um, I think is something that was pretty traumatizing for quite a few people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pension files really do sound interesting. I can tell why uh, you've, you've been able to do so much with them. Um, another question actually about that involves pension files comes from Michelle Grant, who is looking for an individual in the 113th USCT infantry. Uh, so I think she's asking for general advice about where to look, but specifically um, she's asking, is it a good idea to request a pension file with XC on it, which I don't, uh, I've never come across that. Um, I'm intrigued whether either of you have uh, yes, quite a few of those. Um, 
I'm trying to remember what my success has been with pulling those particular numbers. Uh, that was generally, I think, a, a cross uh, reference basically for the pension and house. The records moved several times as the Pension Bureau changed hands and moved to the Department of the Interior. So there are a lot of ins and outs <laughs> as to how pensions were filed and kept track of. Um, so something I would recommend is getting in touch with the National Archives in Washington, D.C. They have a whole army of archivists on hand to answer those kinds of questions. Um, so if you can, you know, give them a specific name, they might even be able to give you some information up front. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact issues with XC, but I think it's worth talking to somebody before attempting to pull it just to make sure it's on hand and they're able to find it. Um, that's definitely worth checking into, but they're available, I think, to do that and should be pretty forthcoming with the information they have. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had no idea what those letters XC meant, so that's, uh, that's really interesting to hear. Um, maybe just one final question. Both of you mentioned photographs, um, and it it was obvious uh, and, and probably was already obvious to everyone that photographs are scarce of African Americans during the Civil War era. Um, so maybe uh, uh, you could you could answer the question, how likely is it that you might find a photograph of somebody? Um, but also, you know, what the best places to look, you know, to improve your odds, maybe. Mm. Okay, so I, I, I'll take that one. <laughs> uh, not only as a historian, I'm also like if I took you on a tour of my house, I collect antiques and collectibles and artifacts and things of that sort. Um, coming across pictures of African Americans, an original picture, not a print, for that period of time is extremely rare and hard to come by. And I am pretty much convinced at this point that every time one surfaces in in the public or at auction or whatever, the National Archives goes and buy it and puts it in their own collection. I feel that way about it. Um, so it really depends on what you call a picture. Um, I stopped so much worried about a physical picture of a person and I started noticing the difference between on documentation, the X4 signature and an actual signed name. And to me, because writing was so rare for the enslaved community. When I see a signature of an enlistment paper or a pinch or anything and they sign their name instead of X and, and the, um, the government personnel would write on the X his mark, which was saying that they can't write and so we just ask them to do an X and it's considered their signature. So now when I see uh, uh, an enslaved or former enslaved individual able to write their name, that to me is a picture because it's their hand, it's their signature, and it's amazing that they can do that at all for that period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've looked through 370 pensions now and I found two photos mm -hmm. in them, um, which I think is a lot <laughs> comparatively. Uh, with photographs and the pension files, for example, I know men would send them in so they could be used in place of them showing up for interviews. So to identify oneself to former comrades, to uh, people who were being interviewed by the pension to back up information that they'd given to, to pension agents. Um, but most of the times those were returned to the family. Uh, often the family specifically requested it. So if they're anywhere, they're likely to be in personal possession or made their way through various sites like auctions. Um, I know yeah. the National Archives has definitely been collecting photographs, so I'm sure that's, they've got a whole trove of things I don't even know about. <laughs> but yeah. uh, it and, is I, and I really track rare. the auctions. I've seen pictures go for six and seven hundred dollars yeah. for a picture. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's tough, but I think like you said, having the signature, having um, any kind of written record that gives some sense of who these people were and where they were is just worth its weight in gold. Yeah, and I think that's one of the messages I'll take away from your presentations and the discussion this evening is the value of trying to dig down beneath the documents almost. And, you know, the really scarce information you can get about a lot of people um, might not mean too much by itself, but if you can piece it all together, put it in context, and then just use your imagination a little bit to figure out what they were actually like. And I know Kara has done that with uh, her own ancestors, the Fraction family, really successfully. 
Um, well, I'm afraid to say we're out of time. Uh, I do want to say thank you very much to the audience for your participation and for the questions. We really appreciate those. Um, I want to encourage you all to sign up for our next webinars. Again, the website is civilwar.vt.edu. Uh, maybe that's the first thing you should do now when we sign up is uh, go straight there and sign up for the next two webinars in October, later in October and one at the end of November. Um, but most of all, I want to thank both our presenters, Dr. Mosley Hubs and Dr. Newhall, for sharing your expertise tonight. It's been a pleasure to listen to you and learn from you. And I know the audience uh, joins me in thanking you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks.